three weeds you're probably not eating. Yes, that's the topic of today's video. How you doing? I'm Adam Harrington. I'm hanging out here in the woods in eastern North America, right around the vernal equinox, so early spring. And this is the perfect time of year, especially if you're hungry, to start looking for some of these fresh green emerging growths because many of them are edible and many of them are medicinal. However, for some strange reason or another, a lot of us overlook these plants. And that's unfortunate because if we're interested in sourcing local, sustainable, and nutritious ingredients directly from our landscape, then we'd be wise to pay more attention to these plants. So what I want to do for you in this video is introduce you to some of these weeds that not only grow in areas like this, but they might be growing in your backyard. And even though I do refer to these plants as weeds in this video, I honestly don't like to use that term too often. I like to call plants by their names. However, because these plants are considered non-native to North America, invasive and quite aggressive, a lot of people consider these plants to be weeds, and so I'm just going to play that game in this video. Also, just because I live in the eastern half of North America doesn't mean these plants can't be found elsewhere. So a few of these species can be found all over the continent, and I'm going to tell you which plants those are. So, without any further introduction on my part, let me just say thank you so much for tuning into this video. Let's go find a few of these weeds that you're probably not, but could be, eating. The first weed you're probably not eating is this little one right down here, and it's this one I'm holding right here. So this is the narrow-leaved bittercress, cardamony impatiens. So this is a brassica vegetable, kind of like garlic mustard that grows around here, but it's also related to broccoli, kale, kohlrabi, and Brussels sprouts. Those are all mustards or brassica vegetables. And like the brassica vegetables, this one has those pungent mustard oils. Whenever you taste it, whenever you crush the leaves and you smell it, it smells like those pungent mustard oils. So this one, as I mentioned, belongs to that genus Cardamony. Worldwide, there are about 150 species of Cardamony. Here in Pennsylvania, where I live, there's about 13 species. Some of them are native, some of them are non-native, but they usually go by those common names of cresses or toothworts. Now this one, Cardamony impatience, is native to Europe and Asia. Here in North America, it's mainly found in northeastern North America, though interestingly, it's also been reported to grow in California. Its life cycle is typically as an annual or biannual, and when this plant is mature, it can grow to be very tall and leafy, and it can grow to be about two feet tall. Now right now, it looks very fern-like because it's very young. So right now in the spring, it lays very low as a basal rosette. When you look at the leaves, you see that they're pinnately compound leaves. So each leaf has about 13 to 19 narrow, sharply toothed leaflets. And then once this plant grows taller, you will see that these main leaves actually clasp the stem. That's a key identifying characteristic. I don't see any flowers right now because typically this plant flowers in May. And you'll usually find this plant in moist soils, not always in disturbed habitats, and it can do well in partial shade as well. Now the narrow leaf bittercress is very closely related to another bittercress that maybe you're familiar with. And we can consider that plant to be weed number 1.5 because I won't talk about it too much, but that's hairy bittercress, Cardamony hirsuta. That one's native to Europe, Western Asia, also Northern Africa, introduced here to North America. It's actually way more common, in my opinion, and abundant compared to the narrow leaf bittercress. This plant's found all over eastern North America, down south through the southern states, and all up and down the west coast. And this one commonly inhabits lawns and gardens. The leaves are rounded, somewhat egg-shaped, and the upper surfaces of the leaves are minutely hairy, hence that species name, Hirsuta. Now, as I mentioned before, the narrow leaf bittercress and also the hairy bittercress, they both have these pungent mustard oils. So whenever you bite into them, and you chew them, they're kind of hot and they're kind of peppery. They have those mustard oils and they taste very good. I really like the taste of them. I tend to treat them as a trail side nibble. I don't really bring them home and cook with them, though I will add them to other greens and bulk up with my greens with these wild vegetables right here. But you can cook with them. You can do whatever you want with them. I just tend to treat them as a trail side nibble and I eat them raw. Now beyond edibility, both of these have medicinal qualities. And specifically in the case of the narrow leaf bittercress, this plant had been used in traditional Western Asian medicine, specifically to treat asthma and hay fever. And whenever we look at the research, like other brassica vegetables, these cresses have these sulfur-rich compounds known as glucosinolates. These glucosinolates are enzymatically broken down in our bodies into compounds known as isothiocyanates. And these isothiocyanates have been involved in the elimination and the metabolism of xenobiotics from our bodies and also carcinogens. And xenobiotics are foreign compounds like drugs and food additives and also environmental pollutants. And research shows that diets high in cruciferous vegetables, remember these are cruciferous vegetables, diets high in cruciferous vegetables have been linked to lower risk of various cancers, including bladder, breast, colorectal, gastric, lung, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate, and renal cancer. So I encourage you to get out and look for both of these plants. See if you can find them this time of year. 
see if you've been overlooking these plants all along and see if you can add these to your wild food meal plans. The second weed you're probably not eating is this one right here. You can see some of the leaves down here. Last year's flowering stock, and these are some of the fresh leaves. So this one is another mustard species, and it should come as no surprise we're talking about another mustard because there are thousands worldwide. About 3,400 species of mustard worldwide, and a lot of them do grow wildly. So this one is Dame's Rocket, Hesperus matronalis. So that genus name, Hesperus, comes from the Greek word Hesperos, which means evening star. That's a suitable name because the flowers of this species seem to be more fragrant in the evening. Worldwide, there are about two dozen species in the Hesperus genus. Here in North America, it's really easy because we only have one, Hesperus matronalis, which is Dame's Rocket. And this one can be found all over the United States, except in the most southern states. So Dame's Rocket is native to Eurasia, though it was introduced to North America as a garden plant centuries ago. And it's also been a common component of wildflower seed mixes. So no surprise, it's a very common plant in North America today. And because of its beautiful wildflower, many people actually think that this plant is native, but it's not. So Dame's Rocket is commonly found in moist soils, wet meadows, and also floodplain areas, though you'll usually see it in roadside ditches whenever you're driving up and down the roads. This plant has a biennial life cycle. Sometimes it lives as a short-lived perennial, and while it can grow two to three feet tall, this time of year, in early spring, it lays very low to the soil with just some of these tufts of leaves shooting out. So that's what you're looking for this time of year. You're looking for these tufts of leaves that are lanceolate, meaning they're lance-shaped, and they're much longer than they are wide. Also, another key feature of this plant is that the leaves are slightly hairy and slightly velvety. Also, another way to positively identify Dame's Rocket in the early spring, even from a distance, is to look for these dried flowering stalks. So all of these are dried flowering stalks from Dame's Rocket. And a few things you want to look for, look for the alternately spaced branching up and down these stalks. Also, you'll see a unique structure known as a silique. This is the remnant from the silique, which are the seed pods. You can see little holes in them, and these are a few inches long. Now, I don't see any flowers on here now because it's a little too early, but this plant will flower mid-spring through early summer. The flowers, like all cruciferous vegetables, are four-petaled, and these particular ones are some shade of purple, pink, or white. Now, don't confuse this plant for a phlox species. Phlox flowers are five-petaled. When you look at the branching arrangement along the stem, you will see that phlox species have oppositely arranged branches. Remember, Dame's Rocket has four-petaled flowers and alternately spaced branching up and down the stem. So how do we eat Dame's Rocket? Well, this time of year, early spring, just about the only thing that's available from this plant are these fresh greens down here. So what you could do is harvest some of these young greens, just pick some of them off. And I like to harvest the smaller ones, especially if I'm going to eat them raw. First, look and make sure that they're slightly hairy, slightly velvety, and then you can pop them in your mouth raw. And because it is a wild mustard, it kind of tastes like those cresses that we found a little earlier. So those mustard oils really come out. Peppery, kind of hot, and I really like it. Now because there's some substance to these ones compared to some of those cresses, I like to harvest a bunch of these, bring them home, and I like to cook them up. I like to put them on the pan with a little bit of fat, cook them just for about a minute or two till they get brown and crispy, and they're absolutely delicious. Now the greens aren't the only parts of the plant that you can harvest this time of year. Yes, that's about the only part that you can harvest. But once the flowers appear, you can actually harvest the flowers, eat those raw. You can also eat the flower buds. It's kind of like broccoli. You can cook them up on the pan with a little bit of fat as well, and they taste delicious. If you're interested in learning how to forage those flowers and cook them up, I did film a video on that a couple months ago, so just scroll through some of the YouTube archives and you'll find that video. Now beyond edibility, this plant does have medicinal qualities because it is a cruciferous vegetable. It does have those glucosinolates which get enzymatically broken down into those isothiocyanates. Also, a study was published in 2010 in the journal BMC Complementary and Alternative Medicine showing that an extract of Dame's Rocket had potent, so very strong antimicrobial activity against the gram-negative pathogenic bacteria Salmonella typhimurium. So not only is this an edible plant, it's a medicinal plant, and I encourage you to get out, look for Dame's Rocket, look for these dried flowering stalks, and look for these greens, harvest some of these, taste some of these raw, bring them home, cook them up, and see what you think. So for the third and final weed that you're probably not eating, we're going to move away from the dicots into the monocots as we talk about this plant right here. So this one has a bunch of common names, field garlic, crow garlic, wild garlic, wild onions. I'm probably just going to call it wild garlic for this video. And honestly, you might be familiar with this plant. A lot of people are familiar with this plant, but they're not eating it for some reason. And if you do like garlic, if you like cultivated garlic, then I don't see why you wouldn't like this plant. 
So this belongs to the Allium genus. It's a large genus, hundreds of species worldwide. It contains a lot of the species that we're familiar with eating and buying and growing, like cultivated garlic, onions, chives, and leeks. Here in Pennsylvania, there are about six species of Allium. In North America, there are dozens of species of Allium. This particular one is Allium viniali. This one is native to Great Britain, most of Europe, Northern Africa, and the Middle East. And this plant is very common in disturbed areas and also open woods. All parts of this plant have a strong scent of garlic or onion when crushed. So if you're just smelling it when it's not crushed, you probably won't detect that aroma, but crush this plant, pull it up, break it, chew on it, and it's going to have that strong smell and taste of garlic or onion. So Allium viniale is found in eastern North America, but it's also found up along the west coast. The entire plant with the flowering stalk can be one to three feet tall, but now in early spring, it's about eight to 12 inches tall. So wild garlic has grass-like leaves that are semi-erect, but they can bend and droop over. And a key identifying feature is that each leaf is round in the cross section. Also, the bulbs have a papery outer coating that can pull right off. As far as taste, wild garlic tastes like cultivated garlic, but this one is much, much, much stronger. And I don't really eat this as a trailside nibble. I don't really snack on it raw as I'm walking through the woods, just because I don't want that garlicky breath as I'm spending my time outside. Though if that's you, if you really like to have that breath as you're walking through the woods, that's perfectly fine. What I tend to do is just take out my knife, harvest some of the green portions, pop them in a bag and bring them home. You can also harvest some of the bulbs, dig them up. Just remember to remove some of this membrane skin, this fiber skin, before you eat it and before you cook with it. As far as meal preparation, what I like to do once I bring it home, I like to slice these real thin and add them at the end of a meal almost as a garnish and I also like to put them into stir-fried meals and they taste really really good especially with cooked eggs. Now medicinally Allium species are rich in these sulfur containing compounds which account for that pungent aroma of these plants. Specifically with Allium viniali we see that this plant is rich in many pharmacologically active compounds including allyl methyl disulfide and diallyl disulfide. And as a whole, these sulfur-containing compounds found within this plant may have antiparasitic properties, antifungal, antibacterial, and antiviral properties. So I encourage you to explore your woods, maybe explore your backyard, your garden beds for Allium viniali and give it a shot. If you really like cultivated garlic, I'll bet you'll like wild garlic just as much, if not more. And there we have it. Three weeds you're probably not eating, though hopefully after watching this video, Hopefully after positively identifying these species yourself, you'll be adding at least a few of these plants to your wild food meal plan this year. And of course, these aren't the only wild edible greens that can be foraged in the early spring months. They're just some of the plants that I'm seeing today, some of the ones that I really enjoy eating myself. Thank you so much for watching this video. As always, I truly appreciate it. Feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Head on over to learnyourland.com. Sign up for the email newsletter so that we can stay in touch with one another. You can also find me on social media, Instagram, Facebook, at learnyourland. Thanks again for watching. Happy early spring foraging.